as we move as we move into session two, we're going to turn it to "You're as beautiful as a butterfly because all they see is Jesus." That was my original inspiration for this. There was a woman who came into a Bible study I was in, and she talked to us about how hard she tried to serve God, and she would commit her life to God, and she would try so hard, but she always wound up reverting to the worm. She talked for about 15 minutes. She called herself a worm about 20 times. And I was reminded of how there's a butterfly, but there's still a worm in the middle because my son and I did a science project. He was homeschooled from the fifth grade through college. And we did a science project where we had two worms that we caught that were exactly alike because we wanted to see what kind of butterfly they were. One of them, well, both of them, we gave them fresh leaves every day in their quart jars. They didn't need water because the moisture is in the leaves. And one day I saw that one of the jars was missing, and I thought, okay, he's taking care of it. He thought the same thing. We found it the next day, and that poor little caterpillar had no leaves at all. We quickly threw a bunch of leaves in there, and he started eating again. But he cocooned two days later than the first one. Now, that could have been because he was born two days later. But we timed how long they were in the cocoon. And the one that had the gap in eating for 24 hours, he took three days longer to come out of the cocoon. The one that got to eat all the way through, he had his wings open and flew away within two hours. The one that didn't get the leaves struggled for hours and hours. He couldn't get his wings open. I tried to help him. I messed him up. He's now maimed. But their life cycle is not very long, so he's no longer with us. But... I didn't help him at all, okay? <laughs> Still feel guilty, but hey. <laughs> so what we're going to do is something kind of strange. We're going to compare the parable of the sower and the seeds, which is the parable is about, it's not really about a garden. It's really about how the ground is in the hearts of the people that the, the good news of Jesus is sown to. And every time... I would have a, um, every time I would read that, God would bring to me how it compares to a butterfly. And it's been a long journey. It's probably been about five years that this has been coming on. But you can compare the parable of the sowers and the seeds to the life cycle of a butterfly because there's a lot of common ground. Um, on the parable of the sower and the seed, if the seed doesn't hit the right soil, the seed's not going to make at all. If it goes on to the stony ground, then it's going to, I mean, if it goes on to the, um, what is the first one? If it goes by the wayside, which he said is where the birds were, a wayside, I looked it up, it's kind of like a path. So in other words, it lands on ground that's pretty trodden down. And it's very easy for the birds to see, they come and take it. But even the disciples didn't understand that parable. They had to ask Jesus, what did it mean? And he compared it and told it to him. And he said that when the, the parable of the wayside is, when someone receives the message about the kingdom and they do not understand it, then the evil one comes and steals the seed from their heart. So they don't ever get in where they should have gone in because the seed was stolen before it had a chance to do anything. On the stony ground... There is a, just a little bit of soil, enough to make it sprout, not enough to make it put its roots down. A plant has to dig its roots down so that they can stay cool. That way it can, uh, the plant doesn't scorch and die. It has to pick up the nutrients from the soil, and the nutrients are in the deep soil, not the top soil. So it can't get to them where the nutrients are. So it can never make the big plant. The tares... Well, Jesus said that one was the f seeds falling on rocky ground which compared to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. I thought that was strange. But they never put down roots, so they don't last long. The tares are the weeds. Tares grow, tares are weeds, and they grow, in some translations it calls them thorns. They grow faster. Thank you. They grow, fast, grow faster than the plants do. So they cover the ground with roots and it makes it really hard for the other plants to survive because they can't get a good root system going. 
they also go up and out faster than the other plants. So the other plants, when they're little, they don't get enough sun. So that's why a real plant has a struggle when there's a lot of weeds around it. And Jesus said, the th weeds, seeds falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the words, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. It's not that they die, they just don't do well. They're not fruitful. And if you're a Christian and you're not fruitful, then all the people you should have reached don't get reached, okay? The good soil is nourishing soil. It's balanced. It has a good root system. It pulls all the nutrients it needs from the soil. The plant above ground can grow big and bear fruit. The good soil holds water but doesn't saturate and let the roots drown. But when Jesus said, the seeds that fall on the good soil refer to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop of 100 or 60 or 30 fold. So the first one was somebody who did not understand. The last one was somebody who understood. The middle one was somebody who received it with joy, but they never dug in deep. The way that compares to a butterfly is the butterfly, it is, its life is determined before it ever gets here, before it ever starts. The stony ground is the person who did the, did the get you, sorry, the person who uh, heard the good news but did not understand it. A butterfly worm has only one job, eat. They eat all day long. They only stop to sleep. They're voracious eaters. A follower of Jesus, especially a new one, needs to eat the word voraciously. They need to learn everything they can learn. They need to know what angers God so they don't do it. They need to know what God expects of you so you can do it. They need to know how much God truly loves them so that they will go to him when they mess up and not slink away into the night and fall away. Every weapon that we have to access is found in there. Everything that God blesses us for is found in there. Everything you need to know to become closer to God and experience his amazing presence is found in there. All of the traps Satan uses to pull you down, they're in there. And the way to get out of them, by the way, is in there. If the new believers do not understand these things, when Jesus, when Jesus says, when anyone hears the message and they don't dig in and they don't learn these things, then they're the ones that fall away because they have no defense and they have no stamina. Number two is the seed on the stony ground. That was the person who received the good news with joy but never grew. Even a butterfly has a plan laid out before it's born. The plant is chosen very carefully by the adult. She puts the eggs underneath the leaf because that limits the predators. Some of the predators know that. So she lays over 100 eggs on the bottom of multiple leaves on one plant. And if there's a whole stand of that kind of flower, she puts them on all the flowers. That way, her seed has a chance of growing. Did I mention that butterflies were, caterpillars were voracious eaters? My mother spent weeks driving the back roads in West Texas around her house trying to find the wild asparagus that grew on the side of the roads. She brought home five or six really nice plants, planted them in her garden, and they were doing wonderful. She was so happy when the first spears came out of the ground, okay? The next summer, she went outside to check the spears, and there was nothing there but sticks. Nothing at all. She got so angry. My mother was peaceful, but she got really, really put out over her asparagus plants. So she started watching it like a military leader, okay? And she found all of these big, fat butterflies climbing around, I mean, caterpillars climbing around on her plant. So she would pull them off and kill them because she wanted her asparagus. She did that for like two or three seasons, and then she told her boss one day, she goes, I used to have all these beautiful, big swallowtail butterflies. They don't come anymore. Without missing a beat, her boss said, stop killing the babies. So, <laughs> so she was so upset because now she's caught. She wants the swallowtails. She wants the uh, asparagus. I told her, plant more asparagus. She said, 
that'd just make more worms. I went, how's that a problem? That'd make more butterflies. And she goes, I, I left and went home, so I don't know which one she chose. But I know that she was grieving it really hard because she wanted the swallowtails and she wanted the butterflies. But the swallowtail babies, there was nothing left. I'm talking an eight inch stick on the ground. They ate everything. When we want to succeed in serving Jesus, we're gonna have to go after it like that. We're gonna have to learn everything we can learn, do everything we can do, and if we don't, we're not gonna prepare, be prepared for what comes at us. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no guidance, a person falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses the way. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but because they have no roots, they only last a short, short time. When trouble comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Persecution comes because of the word. No matter how excited they are when they begin, they have no foundation in the word. They're prey to false teachings. When trouble comes, they won't know how to handle it or even know that it's normal for trouble to come. They will be ripe for Satan, who loves killing the babies. Comparison number three is the seed falling among the tares, which was the person who received the word, but the cares of life and the love of money choked it out. Butterflies are beautiful, and they seem like they're free and dainty but they face negative predators their entire life cycle. Some of the predators eat the eggs, some of the predators eat the caterpillars, some of the predators eat the butterflies. That's why the adult lays so many eggs. Butterfly predators include reptiles like lizards and snakes, mammals like dogs who like to chase them but they don't really eat them, and cats who chase them and eat them because they are immune to the poison even on the monarch butterflies. Amphibians like frogs and toads, humans, I did not know this, humans in countries like Asia, Mexico, and Africa eat butterflies. Some eat the worm, some eat the wings, and some eat the whole thing. But humans are predators in other ways too. We lived in Florida for two and a half years when my children were babies. My son was actually born there. The monarch mi migration there was so heavy that the streets were carpeted with orange butterflies. The sidewalks were carpeted with orange butterflies because there were so many butterflies you couldn't miss them, even if you tried. And um, windshield. If you ran out of water in your little windshield tank, you had to pour water on your window and turn the windshield wiper on because there were that many butterflies. We humans also have children who pull wings off of things just to see what happens. Butterfly collectors who mount them on boards. By the way, that's not very good for the butterfly. <laughs> we plow up their habitats and cause them to have to search for food elsewhere. If they can't find food, they can't lay eggs. And while 30 years ago there were so many monarchs in Florida that you could not avoid them, they are now on the pre-endangered list. Much of their habitat has been repurposed for housing, industry, and other measure. And this is not a green earth sermon, by the way. When we moved back to Texas from Florida, we moved on to a six acre tract of land. The day before we moved on, we moved a trailer house onto there. The day before we went, my husband said, you've got to see this. He took us for a picnic in the back where it was going to be the backyard. And there was what they call a slough in South Texas. It's a ditch that when it rains, it fills up with water and then it drains into the river three blocks over. <laughs> it does have an alligator, by the way. <laughs> And he would, took us there, and there were so many butterflies, and most of them were monarchs. They were on our sandwiches, they were on our heads, they were on our mouths, they were on our hands, they were, on our, they were in our drinks. Nobody ate because we weren't sure whether you should eat after a butterfly is climbing around on it or not. But, okay, mother wouldn't let my kids eat, okay? Uh, <laughs> the next year, about two years later, we got to enjoy the monarchs for three years. Two, two years after that, the landowner came there with his tractor, and he goes, I'm so tired of that stand of weeds. It was milkweeds, which is the only thing monarchs will eat. And they, he plowed them all down. The next season, 
the monarchs flew through and just kept going. And I lived there for 13 years, and I never saw a monarch again. So plowing it, we are doing all kinds of things. We are predators to them in every kind of way. And that's just like in our life. Satan is a predator to us in every kind of way. He goes at us at everything he can think of, from every angle he can think of, and not one element of our life is safe. But we have God. And God can undo it. And God can back him off. And God can make him stay off. A lot of the reasons that people... I don't know why I'm stuttering so bad. I think I'm thinking faster than my mouth can go. The... A lot of the reasons that people come to Jesus to start with is they're in the middle of a crisis, okay? God helps them with peace, direction, and answers, and they're very ready to love and serve him. But becoming a Christian does not take your challenges away. There will always be bills to pay, emergencies to handle, stresses at work, difficulty with family and friends, illness for yourself or someone you know, and a lot of times the income is almost enough money to pay the bills. I can see why people who never are able to get past that part can get caught up in looking at money as something to attain or something to go after. I can confess that I have looked up income streams, different income streams, many times. I used to mystery shop. I used to have three income streams. Then I decided mystery shop is more stressful than it's worth. When life hits us hard, it doesn't mean we stop loving God. It means that we're so preoccupied with life that we don't have time to do ministry, church, or even for encouraging our friends in the Lord. Then again, in that state, in that same state of unfaith, unfruitfulness, and frustration, we become easier prey for false teachers and Satan. We become weak because we're not in the word reminding ourselves who God is, how much he loves us, and what he's willing to do to help. The cares of life even make time the enemy. When life hits us hard, it doesn't mean we stop loving God. That is the same paragraph again. I have a friend, I hope she does not mind me saying this, who last year lost a son, had a major wa- uh, water leak in her house. I'm talking a two inch, two inch wide, two feet tall fountain going everywhere. And she had a couple of health glitches herself. It was a very rugged year, and if she had not been as deeply seated with God as she is, she probably wouldn't be serving him right now. That's why we need to get in deep, because life is going to happen, and sometimes it's going to get ugly, and sometimes it's going to get really, really hard and scary. Not all the time, because God protects us a lot, but when it gets that deep, when it gets that strong, we have got to be seated in God or we're not going to make it. Jesus said the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes it out. Comparison number four, the seed falling on good soil was the person who received the word and understood it. The butterfly has adapted some really odd characteristics to limit the cares of their lives and fool predators. Some have dull colored wings on the bottom, so when they fold them up, they look like a leaf. Some of the little caterpillars And I saw pictures of this on the internet. It's kind of creepy, kind of funny. Some of the caterpillars have learned to do a posture that makes them look like a baby snake. Some have large circles on their wings, and they open the wings out flat, and that makes it look like there's a big predator there. Some have coloring that shouts, poison. None of the predators eat monarchs. Monarchs are laced with the toxin that's in milkweed, Even the human cultures who eat butterflies will not get near a monarch on their plate. The monarch also does the life cycle two, three times a year, and they can stay cocooned for months if the weather is inhospitable. That's why they've been so plentiful for so long, but they are endangered now. The new Christian who fits this category are the ones who understand the word and act on it. They seek out how to find healing, comfort, confidence, faith, joy, hope, and what will please God. They seek wise counsel in finances, business, troubled relationships, hard marriages, and everything else hard that would pull them down. They learn to be proactive in fighting the cares of life with early intervention. 
They read the word and learn everything they can about what dishonors God and about loving and living for him. They learn what to do to see the enemy coming, what the enemy's favorite <laughs> tactics are on them, and how to avoid them or get out of them. They ask for wisdom, which God gives to anyone who asks freely. They strive to serve to be God's hands extended. They don't give up. They are fruitful. Jesus said, but the seeds falling on the good soil refers to those who hear the word and understand it. This is the one who gets the crop. They produce a crop, 160 or 30 fold. So what can we do to help the person we're trying to share Jesus with? What can we do to up their chances of making it? Even soil can be amended. You can add nutrients to it if it's a weak soil. You can add other nutrients to kind of overpower something that's too harsh. You can take the rocks out before you plant the plants. You can take the weeds out before you plant the plants. When too many seeds fall on the wayside, maybe you could be a little more intentional where you put them, sow them a little bit tighter, or put them in those little things and make little plants and put them exactly where you want them. <laughs> Some people will never be receptive because they've been hurt by a Christian. That's a truth I put in here because I run into that occasionally. We just need to pray that God will heal that very real hurt so that they can find him and have peace. People who are strangers, like witnessing on the street, just need a smile and an ear to listen to them. Some will resist. We're not here to force them, force feed them. We're here to give them a seed and let God do the rest. Draw close to God so he can tell you what to do when you're in a situation where you have a chance to talk to somebody. Present the good news of Jesus in a way that anyone could understand it because we don't want to be throwing the seed that they don't understand and they fall away. Jesus said we, you know, come to him like a little child. So there's nothing wrong with simplifying the gospel to make sure they understand it to start with. That way we could limit some of the ones that are on the wayside. When they accept Jesus and, the stony ground, and its stony ground, the cares of life did not decrease. Tell them to seek God in prayer, read the word, he is ready and waiting and able to help. If it's a need you can meet, especially if God is t dealing with you to meet that need, then help them. When they're honest enough to tell you they're tempted to go back into their old life, do not react negatively. They know how to do that negative life. They know how to do that old life. They've been there a long time. They can see the enemy coming. They know what to do in all different situations. This is brand new and scary, and because they had to change their whole entire lifestyle, it's hard. We need to help them with their questions and concerns. I cannot tell when I'm too loud on this, sorry. We need to prepare them from the beginning that Satan will be on the prowl. There were predators in their old life. The difference is they could see them coming, and they can't see this one. And the predators will use the people from their old life to derail them if he can. Satan will. Be confident and give them biblical counsel on how to get through this one and tell them you'll be available to help them if they need somebody to talk to on the next one. Always, always point them back to God. Talk to him. He wants to help you. So when they become brand new Christians, what can we do to help them along the way? And when they truly love God, the good soil, they're excited, but they get too busy and start getting overwhelmed, they're in danger of falling away. Tell them to pace themselves. Give them scriptures about resting in God. Be excited about what they're excited about. And tell them what you're excited about. Love them the way Jesus loves you, with attention, answers, and love. Encourage them to read the word. You can even start with telling them to look up scriptures that deal with what exactly they're going through. If they've just lost someone, there's scriptures for comfort in God's presence. If they're battling anxiety or fear, there's scriptures for strength, peace, and courage. If they need healing, there are hundreds of scriptures about healing, health, and faith in God. Explain what something means if they're confused. If you don't know, find a Christian who does. Have them talk to him, or have them explain it to you so you can talk to him. 
Tell them trouble will come, but God is going to be right there with them. Talk to him. They will have. They now have a new family of support, and that family should be there when they need them. Help them build a list of scriptures that they can put in a visible place that applies to their biggest temptation or their biggest distress. Be so stable in your walk with God that when they come to you with their questions, what if you were so understanding and friendly that they felt safe enough to tell you what they're really struggling with? Be brave, and if you grew up sheltered, try not to show your shock, okay? <laughs> Make sure they learn to put what they, have t- what they are taught against the word to see if it lines up. If it doesn't match what the Bible says, they need to discard it as false teaching. Make sure they know that when they're overwhelmed, they can come talk to you or others. They can ask for prayer. They can seek counsel. They can tell God they need help. Love them. Forgive any offense that they cause while you're trying to help them. They're brand new at this. They probably don't even know they offended you so deeply. Remember the monarchs in Florida. Don't be the windshield they fly into. Don't be the shoe that crushes them into the sidewalk. Don't think you're better than them. God says you're not. In Romans 12, 3, God said, By the grace given to me, I don't know who said that actually, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What can we do to prepare ourselves for that task? Didn't the word say to be instant in season and out of season? How do we grow into becoming more like Jesus, and why should we even grow into it? When God was comparing the life of the the parable of the sower and the seed to the life of the butterfly, what he was telling us was when, when the butterfly that hatched right, I was looking at it thinking how beautiful it wing, its wings were. I was watching it move, and I was looking because it grew antennas. It didn't have those before. It grew an exoskeleton where the wings are. It didn't have that before. It's tiny now, and it has real legs, not those little sticky things that stick to the leaves so they can crawl around on the bottom of it. The people don't see the worm anymore because all they see is the wings. What if we were so close to God? What if we... We're so concerned with being like Jesus, shining out Jesus, that when people came to find Jesus, they wouldn't see us. They would see Jesus. That's what this is.